I'm going to make a bold claim here. Darwinism fails because it doesn't have a coherent theory for adaptation. Well, that seems a little bit contradictory. One of Darwinism's principal claims is that it has solved the problem of adaptation. Furthermore, it claims to have solved the problem scientifically, hasn't it? If you're a devotee of nature or natural history programming, you have no doubt heard the word adaptation bandied about very frequently. Whatever animal or plant is being talked about, it's always wonderfully adapted to its environment, or some variation on that phrase. Now, just for the record, I think we're right to admire nature and its wonderful contrivances. But there's only one problem with those claims of wonderful adaptation. They're meaningless. Why? Because we have no idea what adaptation is. How do we know it? When we see it, how does it come about? Isn't every living thing wonderfully adapted to its environment? The real question is how this wonderful adaptation comes to be. And Darwinism has failed to answer that question convincingly. The literal meaning of the word adaptation is a tendency to aptitude. By aptitude, we mean a natural ability to function well. Apt function, to put it succinctly. We're supposedly able to measure aptitude through aptitude tests, but what are we really measuring there? Part of what's being measured is natural cognitive ability. How well you associate words with one another. How well you can solve basic logical problems, how well you can work your way through basic mathematical reasoning. But aptitude is always measured in some context. A standard aptitude test measures how apt your cognitive ability is in a scholastic environment, where you'll be expected to engage in reasoning, logic, and numeracy. But testing that kind of aptitude may not test for aptitude for other things like your aptitude at welding, for example, or for working with wood to build a piece of furniture, or for diagnosing a malfunctioning automobile. There are aptitude tests for those things as well, but they are not scholastic aptitude tests. In short, context is an unavoidable aspect of aptitude, how well you function in a particular environment. And this lets us fill in some meaning to that otherwise meaningless phrase, wonderfully adapted to its environment. It's saying that a particular beetle or bird or elephant shrew is able to function well in its surroundings and in the context of how the beetle, bird, or elephant shrew lives its life. Again, context is important. Okay, two more things about aptitude to fill in. First, aptitude describes how well-equipped an organism is to function aptly. Is it built the right way for making its way through its life? A squirrel, for example, is not well-equipped to exist in an environment where it has to fly. A squirrel does not have an aptitude for flying. Now that's an understatement. Birds, on the other hand, are equipped to fly. They have wings, which give them an aptitude for flight. Second, adaptation involves adjusting form and function to novel circumstances. How well can an organism make do, in other words? Squirrels are surface-dwelling rodents. They have an aptitude for gripping tree trunks, for scampering along the ground, for harvesting nuts, those sorts of things. But do they really have no aptitude for flight? Well, squirrels can fly in the sense that they have some control over how they fall through the sky to the ground. This is what flying squirrels do as they fall from tree to tree. Even squirrels that are not flying squirrels can pull off this trick, though, to some degree. They can use their legs as airfoils and their tails as rudders. In other words, surface-dwelling squirrels do have a limited aptitude for flight. Not as great an aptitude as birds, but certainly more aptitude for it than pigs. So squirrels can adapt to flight to a certain extent.
The first systematic student of life, as I've already mentioned, was Aristotle. Among the things that intrigued Aristotle about life was its adaptability. Adaptability was, for Aristotle, the main thing that distinguished life from the material universe. Aristotle's scheme for adaptation was a variation on his whole theory of causation, which, like Plato's, was teleological at its heart. That is to say, Aristotle's theory of causation was frankly purposeful, striving toward some ultimate end. Plato put his ultimate end with the ideals that resided in the mind of the Demiurge, but Aristotle was more down-to-earth, so to speak, especially with regard to life. Let's illustrate this with one of Darwin's favorite animals, pigeons, which were the subject of Chapter 1 of The Origin of the Species. What was it that made a pigeon a pigeon, and not something else, say a sparrow? Plato would say that the pigeon was striving toward some ideal of pigeonness. This ideal was otherworldly, residing in the mind of the Creator. Aristotle would agree with Plato that the pigeon strove to some ideal, but Aristotle located the ideal within the pigeon itself, which he called the pigeon's bios. The pigeon itself is the operational manifestation of the pigeon bios. It's an instrument to realize the bios. And to do so, the pigeon would gather food and water, find mates and warmth. And all this would happen in the context of some environment. Everything the pigeon did, how it flew, how it socialized with other pigeons, was shaped by the bios. The bios was also transmitted from parent to offspring. Within the pigeon egg was a latent pigeon bios inherited from the parents, and the development of the embryo into a pigeon was the egg's formless matter organizing itself to conform to the pigeon bios within. Aristotle's bios was determinative, that is, it determined the form and function of the creature, the pigeon in our case. But it was also an agent of adaptability. Should the environment get colder, for example, the pigeon could develop a thicker coat of feathers. And this was the pigeon organizing itself to conform to its bios. In other words, nature adapts the instruments to the functions. If the warmth was no longer there to seek, the pigeon would build a thicker coat better to hold its heat in. In the end, the pigeon's bios would be sustained. The bios is not strictly determinative, therefore. But adaptability also means that the pigeon is a knowledgeable agent. To adapt, it has to have some knowledge of its circumstance, and it has to know how to shape its form and function to sustain its bios. Thus, Aristotle's bios balanced two opposing influences against one another. On the one hand was continuity and resistance to change. A lineage of pigeons would always be pigeons, and they would be pigeons because their bios was a form of self-knowledge. Pigeons knew to be pigeons, and they strove purposefully toward that end. On the other hand was changeability. The pigeon was the tool to realize the bios, which could adapt, strive towards aptitude to meet the circumstances. But to do so, it would have to have knowledge of its circumstances and know how to strive to change its form and function appropriately. Life, in short, was a delicate balancing act between constancy and change. This balancing act carried over into the earliest emergence of evolutionary thought. By the beginning of the 19th century, the evidence was clear that life had a history. Georges Cuvier had demonstrated this with his fossils. Species had beginnings and they had ends. And this meant that the eternal Aristotelian bios needed to be rethought. It fell to another Frenchman, Jean-Baptiste Lamarck, to make the first try at that. Here was Lamarck's problem. The immutable Aristotelian bios was incompatible with a world where species came and went. And Lamarck turned to contemporary medical theory for his solution, 
vital forces. These were thought to be the means for organisms to realize the Aristotelian bios. Lamarck saw his solution in two of these vital forces. One was a so-called complexifying force, which drove living things towards ever greater complexity. The second was what has come to be called a so-called adaptive force, although the literal translation from the French was the influence of circumstances. Now, it's important to point out that these vital forces weren't really Lamarck's idea. The complexifying force had long been used to explain development, how the complex adult organism arises from the formless egg that gives rise to it. So too with the adaptive force. Ever since Aristotle, adaptation had been recognized as being fundamental to life, and there had to be something that made that possible. So what was new about Lamarck's thinking? Complexifying force and adaptive force were central to the idea of the organism. Lamarck's innovation was to extend the reach of these forces to lineages of organisms. In this way, changes, whether complexifying or adaptive, that occurred within the lifetime of an individual organism could be built upon through the generations. And in this way, lineages would change through time. They would become steadily more complex and they would become ever more closely adapted to circumstances. In other words, they would evolve. Charles's grandfather, Erasmus Darwin, had been a devotee of Lamarck's ideas, and this planted the idea of evolution in Charles's mind and they found fertile ground there. Charles's roots were deep in the natural history tradition grounded in Aristotle's biology, after all. As a student at Cambridge, he was a zealous natural historian, avidly collecting beetles and animal skins and immersing himself in the overwhelming diversity of species in living nature. This was the intellectual baggage he was carrying when he embarked on the HMS Beagle, as ship's naturalist and as gentleman's companion to the Beagle's captain, Robert Fitzroy. When Darwin embarked on the Beagle, he was a creationist of sorts. At the time, the conventional wisdom was that species originated in so-called centers of creation, and this would explain why different continents had different flora and fauna why bison were in North America, and caribou were in Northern Europe, or kangaroos were in Australia, primates in Africa, and anteaters in South America. These creatures were where they were because they had been created there. Darwin had accepted that idea, by and large, and he had hoped to catalog the idea with his collections during the Beagle's voyage. His sojourn in the Galapagos archipelago ultimately disabused him of that idea. As is well known now, and was in fact well known then, each island in the archipelago had its distinct fauna. The Galapagos finches are the most famous example of these, but there were other differences as well. And this posed a dilemma for the center of creation idea. Was each island its own center of creation, each situated within a few miles of each other? That didn't make sense. Trying to make sense of it was the origin, if you will, of Darwin's theory of the origin of species. Much has been written about this, and I won't repeat it here. What I would like to do, rather, is to focus on Darwin's ideas about adaptation and heredity. Darwin's thinking was strongly imbued with the Aristotelian bios. No surprise there, he came from the Aristotelian tradition of natural history. But his affiliation with breeders and fanciers posed a dilemma for that idea. Those practical-minded people had replaced Aristotle's immutable bios with a hereditarian concept of ancestral memory. A pigeon was a pigeon, because, in some unknown way, pigeons today were a memory of its pigeon ancestors, 
and pigeons today would be the remembrance of future pigeon generations. Breeders knew those memories could be changed and mixed. New breeds of pigeons could be brought into being by controlling how they bred, that is, how hereditary memory was passed from generation to generation through artificial selection, in a phrase. Darwin had the idea that something like artificial selection could produce new species in nature, but there was a sticking point. What could produce such a natural selective breeding? What would do the selecting? By 1832, Darwin thought he had a solution. Inspired by Thomas Malthus, who saw struggles for existence as shapers of human economies, Darwin thought a similar struggle for existence could be the engine for his theorized process of natural selection. And adaptation would be the selector. Here's how that would work. In any generation of creatures, there would be variability and aptitude for the struggle. In this little chart, green stars are the individuals with the greatest aptitude, and the red circle represents creatures with the least aptitude. Let's say that in the first generation, the proportion of aptitudes is roughly equal. Those individuals with greater aptitude when they breed would leave offspring, and those that were less apt or inapt would leave fewer or none. If the aptitude could be inherited, the next generation would consist of more apt individuals and fewer inapt individuals. The continual selection for heritable aptitude, generation upon generation, would eventually create a new species of green stars exclusively, as expressed in our symbols. In short, Darwin's entire theory of natural selection was centered around adaptation, heritable adaptation at that. And adaptation was Darwin's long-sought agent for natural selection. Darwin thought he had hit upon an entirely mechanistic conception for evolution, a kind of clockwork evolution. Wind it up, let it go, and it would spin new species all on its own. And one did not need the messy teleology that was implied in the Aristotelian bios. In fact, Darwin just framed the bios in a different language. That is to say, he had to confront the same dilemma Aristotle did. He had somehow to reconcile the conservatism of lineages, why pigeons begat pigeons and not something else, with the need to change and adapt to circumstances. And adaptation was crucial to the reconciliation. And that also brought him face to face with the same problem faced by Lamarck, namely how could adaptation be inherited in lineages? Darwin was not thinking about this in terms of the Aristotelian bios, and Lamarck's vital solutions also were no solution. Nobody believed in them anymore. Rather, he thought heredity would provide the solution. Species would evolve because the memory of past adaptation in ancestors would somehow be conveyed to descendants. Now, it must be said that no one at the time knew very much about heredity. Breeders thought of heredity as being carried in some kind of hereditary fluid. And this is where our phrase, in the blood, comes from. Around the mid-19th century, fluid concepts of inheritance were giving way to a so-called particulate concept of heredity. This meant that inherited memory was carried on particles of some sort. Gregor Mendel's famous experiments with peas, for example, were intended to explore this so-called particulate nature of inheritance. Mendel conducted his work in the 1850s, just to put him on the timeline. Whether heredity was particulate or fluid, it still had to explain both continuity of form over generations and adaptability of form. In the evolutionary context, it had to explain both continuity and adaptability over generations. Darwin concocted his own scheme for this, which he published in the 1870s. He called his scheme pangenesis. Let's explore this idea for pigeons. Imagine that during a pigeon's lifetime, 
it adapts by becoming slightly darker in plumage. Heredity would be conveyed by two types of hereditary particles. One, so-called hard inheritance, was conservative. That is to say, it was determinative. When the pigeon mated, for example, particles of hard inheritance would carry heritable form and function to its offspring, producing a pigeon just like its parent. That is to say, hard inheritance would ensure that the offspring have light-colored plumage. Adaptation, on the other hand, would be carried on particles of so-called soft inheritance. Darwin called these particles gemmules. These would be conveyed from the body's tissues to the sperm or ova, the gametes. In our example, gemmules for darker plumage would be carried into the pigeon's gametes, and these would be passed to the offspring along with the particles of hard inheritance, and this would ensure that the offspring would not only be a pigeon like its parents, but also a pigeon with darker plumage. The parent's adaptation would be transmitted to the offspring, in other words. New species could then come from continual selection for adaptation over many generations. Darwin thought he had hit upon a law-driven mechanism for the origin of species, something akin to the motion of the planets. Furthermore, he thought his law-driven solution was purged of the messy teleology of Aristotle's bios. In fact, he just reframed the fundamental purposefulness of life that sat at the heart of the Aristotelian bios. Darwin couldn't escape the teleology, in other words, he just hid it away behind new concepts of heredity. This is one of the fundamental incoherencies that sits at the heart of the Darwinian idea. What tripped up Darwin's aspirations for a law-driven theory of evolution was a fundamental property of adaptation. To wit, adaptation involves knowledge of the world and acting upon that knowledge to sustain the organism. Adaptation is a willfully intentional and intelligent act. Adaptation is inescapably purposeful and, in its own way, teleological. Darwin tried to have his cake and eat it too. He wanted to purge adaptation's essential purposefulness while still making adaptation a central part of his mechanistic theory. He could not do both, and that is what led directly to the late 19th century crisis of Darwinism. Thank you.